Hello world. Today I'll be talking about one of my favorite topics in math, a brilliant idea that has incredible practical utility. What is the fast Fourier transform and why is it fast? Specifically, I'll be introducing the Fourier transform and a fast way of doing it from a concrete computational point of view. This video is not about a general intuition of what Fourier transforms are. There are wonderful resources on that subject already that I'll link in the description. This video is a way of coming at the subject obliquely, from a different angle than is standard in math, but one that I think has much to recommend it. This approach is inspired, to put it generously, by a very well-known textbook, Introduction to Algorithms, better known as CLRS. As a student without much background in Fourier analysis, I found this approach to be very enlightening and to provide a good foundation for future learning. I hope you can say the same after this is over. There's a couple of things I'm going to assume familiarity with to get the most out of this video. I have links in the description for resources to help brush up on these. If you need them, use them first, and then come back here. I'll be discussing the speed of algorithms using big O notation. A basic grasp of that is required. You'll need to be familiar with complex numbers and roots of unity. And lastly, our main subject will be polynomials, so a basic familiarity with those is essential. Without further ado, let's get started. Our main topic of interest is polynomials. What are they, really? We're only interested in polynomials of a single variable. A polynomial is an expression containing only multiplication and addition. No fractional exponents, no trig functions, or what have you. These are all polynomials. Polynomials are functions, and we often think of functions as graphs. Here's what one such polynomial looks like as a graph. It's natural to ask what the highest power of x in the polynomial is. We call this the degree, so here f has degree 2. It's also natural to ask where the polynomial evaluates to zero. We call these the roots. f has roots at 1 and 4. There's a famous result called the fundamental theorem of algebra that connects the degree to the roots. A polynomial of degree n has exactly n roots. Note that this includes complex numbers. This makes complex numbers the more natural choice of domain for polynomials. A polynomial with real coefficients can have no real roots, but a polynomial always has exactly the right number of complex roots. We can write the polynomial using the roots by multiplying together one term for each root. When x is 1, x minus 1 becomes 0, and the whole thing returns 0. When x is 4, the same thing happens. Note that there are tons of other quadratics with these two roots. Any scalar multiple doesn't change them. So how do we represent polynomials? We've already seen two ways, collecting like terms and storing those coefficients, and storing the roots plus a constant multiplier. Both of these require storing n plus 1 numbers for a degree n polynomial. Note that there's nothing special about roots here. Just as any two points define a line, so too do any three points define a quadratic, any four points define a cubic, and so on and so forth. Any degree n polynomial is described by any n plus 1 points on it. What things can we do with polynomials, and how quickly can we do them? Let's say we're storing degree n polynomials as a list of coefficients. Adding polynomials can be done in linear time. Simply add together the corresponding coefficients. Evaluating polynomials via the standard school method requires a quadratic number of multiplications. Luckily, Horner's rule lets us evaluate polynomials in linear time by successively factoring out copies of x so that we can reuse our work. Now what about multiplying polynomials? Well, here's where the story gets more interesting. In school, you probably learned to distribute out each term and then collect like terms to get the result of two polynomials multiplied together. This requires multiplying every term in the first ter polynomial with every term from the second, which is O and squared multiplications. This is, well, a bummer. Well, often in computer science, algorithms are made faster by changing the way data is stored. Are other representations of polynomials easier to multiply? Well, yes. If we have two polynomials defined as sets of points, multiplying the polynomials becomes as easy as multiplying together the corresponding y values. This assumes that the x-coordinates are all the same, but this is still a tantalizing speedup. What if we could convert from coefficient form to point value form, multiply there, and then convert back? Would that be faster than the standard method? Well, not quite. Evaluating polynomials takes o n time, and in order to reconstruct the degree 2 n polynomial that our answer will be, we'll need 2 n plus 1 points. Evaluating each of those 2 n plus 1 points by a Horner's rule is already o n squared time. Even the first step of this is no better than the standard method. Often, when algorithms don't work well, a useful approach is to think about where it's possible to make meaningful choices. I've glossed over an important choice. What x-coordinates are we picking to evaluate polynomials at? 
What the rest of this video will show is that this roundabout method is, when done smartly, faster than the standard method. The question is, what points do we pick? The secret sauce turns out to be using a very special set of points, the complex roots of unity. A quick refresher on those and the properties they have that we'll use. The nth roots of unity are the complex number z, such that z to the n equals 1. There are always n such points. In practice, if z to the n is 1, then z squared to the n is, after rearranging, 1 squared, which is just 1. Any integer power of a root of unity is thus also a root of unity. We can actually write the nth roots of unity as the first n powers of a single number, which we'll call omega. Geometrically, the roots of unity have a very special representation. They are the vertices of a regular n-gon with points on the unit circle, such that the first point is 1, or omega to the, to the zeroth power. If we square each of the, say, eighth roots of unity, we get every other vertex on this polygon, which itself forms a regular n-gon with half of the points, the fourth roots of unity in this example. If we have an even number of roots of unity, then they form pairs that square to the same thing. So let's show how we can beat the system by using the roots of unity as our points for multiplication. Let's do this with two cubics. Recall that we need n plus 1 points to define a degree n polynomial, and so we need 7 points for the degree 6 polynomial that these multiply to. We'll go one further and use 8 points because it makes the math easier. So how can we evaluate f at the eighth roots of unity efficiently? We can apply a classic strategy in computer science, divide and conquer. We split the polynomial into all of the odd terms and all of the even terms. The odd terms have a common factor of x we can bring out, and then we get two sub-polynomials with only even power terms. We can think of these polynomials as actually having half of the degree they have now, because we can think of them as working on x squared instead of simply x. So these polynomials are half the size of the original. And we can keep doing this. At each step, we break the problem down into two subproblems, half the size of the original. If we denote the coefficient for the ith power of x by a sub i, we can draw this tree of the smaller subproblems we generate, where each node are the coefficients of that polynomial at that step. For a single polynomial evaluation, this breaking up doesn't save any time. Horner's rule does the same reusing of work more efficiently. We're not doing any random set of polynomial evaluations anymore. We're using the complex roots of unity. Specifically, because the eighth roots of unity square to the fourth roots of unity, these two sub-polynomials only need to be evaluated at four points across the entire set, not eight. The problems that come out of those need only to be evaluated at two points until the constants need only be evaluated once. We can draw a tree that shows how this works. Each polynomial evaluation at the top gets split into two sub-problems and on and on down the tree. For a random set of points, this wouldn't really help, but the brilliant choice of the roots of unity allows us to reuse results over and over again. Let's show how this works for f and omega cubed, the third out of eight, the eighth roots of unity. We first break f into two pieces, which we now want to evaluate at omega to the sixth. Now we break o into two sub-pieces again, which are operating on omega to the sixth squared, or omega to the fourth. At this point, we're just left with constant terms when we break things apart. After evaluating those, we go back up the tree, at each step multiplying the odd result by x and adding them together. So how much work does this take? Because evaluating the constants at the end is just, well, constant time. The real work is in the combining of these separate results. How much of that do we do? Well, one way to think of where the combination is happening is that each arrow represents a constant number of operations. Thus, we can just focus on counting those arrows. The total height of this tree is the log base 2 of n, the number of times we divide before we hit 1. So each path has log n arrows. We start with n total problems at the top. Thus, we do o log n work o n times for a final result of o n log n. The difference between o n log n and o n squared is not to be underestimated. For a degree 1024 polynomial, you get a speed up of over a hundredfold. The more terms you have, the more time you save. There's a little more work we have to do to get back to efficient polynomial multiplication, namely reconstructing the coefficients from the values at the roots of unity. Unfortunately, we don't really have the time for that today. Stay tuned for a more thorough look at this process and applications of the discrete Fourier transform. As I just mentioned, this process of evaluating a polynomial with given coefficients at the nth roots of unity is called the discrete Fourier transform. There's a wide range of applications, and because it's so useful, the fast Fourier transform, as this divide and conquer approach is called, is one of the most important and ubiquitous algorithms in computing. 
I hope you've enjoyed the short introduction to the topic. Please check the description for more resources, and feel free to leave any constructive feedback you wish. Thank you.